vamos a hablar un poquito sobre Anomalisa. Vamos a, a describir un poquito la película para los que no la hayan podido ver. Mm, contaros un poco el origen de este proyecto. Es una película de animación muy especial. Supongo que es una película que ha tenido un proceso largo de, de creación. ¿Cuál fue el origen del proyecto? No translation. <laughs> I hear you, but it's um, I don't hear you. Es canal uno, verdad? Veanlo, dice. Change the channel to two. Two, okay. Two. All right. So, gracias. I was asking about the origins of the anomalies of the project. Um, When did you start uh, working on, on the script, Charlie? Um, and when did you enter in, in, the, in, the, in the process of the, of the film? No translation. <laughs> oh, right. um, I'd written this as a play in 2005, and I directed the same actors were in it, and that was loud. Um, <laughs> A friend of mine had seen the play, um, and he had founded an animation company where Duke is a partner and a director, and he asked if they could um, they could make it into a stop motion film, and I said they could if they if they had the money. So that's what happened. Y Duke, ¿os conocíais antes de de esta de este proyecto? Uh, no, I, uh, Dino, the guy who he's talking about that ran the animation studio where I worked, was friends with Charlie um, and had the script, but I read the script first and then we met with Charlie to ask if we could do the movie and that was the first time meeting him. Obviously I knew of him and I knew his work and I was very familiar with it, but I hadn't met him personally. ¿Por qué una película? ¿Por qué esta película? En, ¿Por qué animación? ¿Y por qué concretamente esta técnica específica de stop motion? Um, how come my inhalations are so loud and yours aren't? <laughs> oh, you're not breathing. You're a puppet. Um, I'm going to try and breathe through my nose. It doesn't matter. Is it really as loud as it sounds to me? It's freaking me out. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's better. Um, oh, it really isn't as loud. Okay. Um, That's what they did at this company, um, so that's why it was offered as a stop motion animation at the time. It didn't, it didn't mean anything to me one way or the other. I didn't want it to be done as a movie. The play was um, something we called a sound play, which meant that the, there were three actors on stage reading scripts. There was uh, Carter Burwell and musicians um, performing music, and there was a Foley artist. And the idea was that the images would be created in the audience's minds and there would be nothing visual on stage except for just this sort of static performance. So there are a lot of ambiguous kind of line. I know you haven't seen the movie yet, but there's a lot of ambiguity in, in terms of uh, issues in the, in the plot points and issues in the, in the story that I didn't want to have to um, make concrete. So, um, but you know, once I, I, I accepted the idea we were going to do it. Duke and I started um, trying to figure out what it would be and how it would work. The fact that it was stop motion seemed to really lend itself to the um, to the themes and the play and to um, and to sort of a kind of a dreamlike quality. I think it's very hard to have this conversation um, have it have any meaning if you haven't seen the film because I'm you know but but I don't know how else to proceed so. Um, uh, so, but that, that's, I think it became obvious that it should be stop motion animation. It worked very well for what we were trying to do um, once we started to plan it. Eh, Charlie, han sido eh, cerca de siete años de silencio profesional, por así decir, o artístico. Eh, me imagino, o solo puedo imaginarme, lo difícil que tiene que ser intentar vender o hacer el pitching de historias tan complejas, tan especiales, tan extraordinarias, eh, conseguir financiación. Sé que Anomalisa también ha tenido un proceso de financiación muy especial, podríamos comentar un poquito, eh, nos podrías comentar un poco en torno a esto. 
pero no, ¿cómo es eh, intentar vender a, a los productores, a una productora, eh, proyectos tan difíciles de, de entender, de tan difíciles de ver, ¿no? antes, de que se hagan, antes de que se hagan realidad? Do you want me to speak to this one and then sure. you can yeah. talk about your yeah. time gap? Uh, with Anomalisa, so we approached Charlie about the possibility of turning it into a movie and he said, as he said before, that if we could get the money to do it, we could do it. So we went off to try to find the money and we did meet with, first of all, we felt immediately that no studio would produce this movie or if they were willing to produce it, they would want to you know, potentially influence it in some way. And we didn't want it influenced it. We wanted it to be Charlie's vision um, and just the way that it was written because it seemed perfect to us in script form. But we did meet with a couple studios, even like younger, seemingly younger um, places that might be open to it. But even, even they were looking at it from a commercial standpoint and saying like, well, we love it, but if you could maybe Uh, consider it as in like episodes or if it could be like um, if it could be uh, several parts or if it could be a television series then then we can talk because they're trying to think about how they can market it but we didn't want to do that we didn't want to break it up so at the time Kickstarter was kind of a new thing and somebody had mentioned it to us and 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 so we set out we didn't know what to expect but we did a Kickstarter campaign and it was very successful for us but even still I think it was very successful because of Charlie's name and because of Dan Harmon's name and Dino Stamatopoulos that people came out and made it successful. But even though it was considered very successful, it was still just the seed money that we needed to um, get started. And then we got an investor, an outside private investor, a man named Keith Calder, who runs a company called Snoot Films. He came in and gave us the money to finance the rest of the film. Um. Yeah, I think I think we were enormously lucky in the way it played out. It was very difficult um, to, you know, to, to get the money. Um, we ran out of money. We needed more money and all that stuff because it's a, such a sort of time-intensive process. I don't think any studio would have started with us, and I certainly don't think anyone would have finished with us. So, um, and it, yeah, in terms of like. The, the thing you refer to as silence is just me not being able to get something made. I wasn't. It wasn't like I. I, I said, okay, I'm not going to work for seven years. I mean, I was writing. I'd uh, written, uh, you know, a few screenplays. I'd written some pilots. I shot a TV pilot um, that didn't get picked up. Um, you know, I think. Um, you know, I directed Synecdoche, New York, which didn't commercially perform in the way that. Um, anyone, I think, was really willing to take a chance on my stuff. Certainly with me as director, probably, even more so. And I think that um, I wanted to direct, so I think that, you know, that, that's probably... You know, one can only speculate as to why you can't get something made, but that, I would say those are the reasons. Um, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting that you are mentioning uh, television. Uh, yo creo que tenemos la idea de que existen una serie de existen una serie de canales eh, eh, de televisión por cable, por ejemplo, o plataformas de streaming, en los que como Amazon o Netflix, en los que se nos vende la idea de que es posible un tipo de trabajo audiovisual más experimental o más arriesgado, pero eh, como estás contando, Charlie, eh, ten, tienes eh, experiencias de pilotos o de ideas de productos televisivos que no que no han sido elegidos o que no les han dado eh, luz verde. Eh, ¿Es realmente el futuro de los cineastas más arriesgados, este tipo de canales de televisión o de plataformas? O incluso en estos campos también existen eh, los mismos patrones económicos que mencionaba, mencionaba Duke hace un momento. You know, I mean, I, I've I've heard it's the golden age of TV, and there's lots of, you know, I think high quality writing and that sort of thing on it. But I think it's sort of within certain parameters. You know, there are certain types of things that get. I, I think everyone still needs an audience. You know, um, and and there's worry about what you're, whether or not you're going to have one. You know, um, because these things cost money to make, and uh, so 
you know, I, I feel, I mean, I, I can only speak to my experience, which is that I couldn't get something made. Um, and um, I did get a pilot made uh, eventually, but they didn't pick it up. And I think that their, their concern was, are we going to have enough people interested in this? I mean, they're, they're sort of eccentric, my shows, um, but they were excited about them, you know, in script form. You know, they were sort of like, but that's a cheap thing for them. They can pay you to write a pilot and, you know, then the commitment comes in production and um, pilot doesn't cost them anything. So they, they can just sort of like, you know, do that. And um, um, But my experience is that, you know, I think you're much safer if you're doing a show that involves crime or police or, you know, something like that. You have a, a much better chance than if you're doing a show that doesn't. And I, and I wasn't. Um, hablemos un poquito porque todos son estudiantes bueno, todos no, porque tenemos también un público eh, fuera de los encuentros literalmente, pero la mayoría de ellos son estudiantes de cine que se han graduado o están en proceso de hacerlo, no sé si los dos eh, tenéis experiencia también pasado como estudiantes en escuelas de cine, si es que sí o es que no, cuál es vuestro punto de vista de en qué medida puede ayudar una formación en una escuela de cine de cara a eh, la vida profesional. Uh, I do, absolutely. I started going to film schools when I was 15. Um, I live, uh, I, I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, and I, I, I was in high school, and I was really into film, and so I would go during the summers, summer break, I would go to Chicago, and I studied at uh, Columbia College in Chicago and took film courses, and then the next summer I went to Princeton University and I studied film courses there and then I ultimately went to NYU for undergrad and I went to the American Film Institute Conservatory in Los Angeles for grad school. For me it was like I wanted to make films but I didn't know how. I didn't know how to break into the industry. I didn't know what to do so studying was you know something that I could do that I felt like I was being productive in in my aspirations to be a filmmaker. But I think the greatest benefit of film school for me were the relationships that I made with people while I was there. Um, you know, I'm still, I'm still friends and collaborate, coll you know, I have friends and collaborators that I went to school with. Um, you know, filmmaking is a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very collaborative process. It, it's a community. Um, and, uh, at least that's been my experience. It's very hard to, to, to do it all by yourself. So the relationships that you make with people um, become very important. And then obviously, you know, having a way to practice and, and doing a lot of things, watching a lot of movies, reading a lot of scripts or books and making a lot of short films and finding your voice um, as you go. I mean, all, all that's important. I don't think you necessarily need film school for that, but it's great to be in an environment where there's a solidarity and everybody has a common interest. You're all interested in film and you learn from each other and inspire each other and kind of challenge each other, make each other go to the next level, I think. So, I mean, that was my experience. It was great, great for me. I went to NYU as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is exactly. I mean, I think it's probably different for different people. Uh, I think it was a play probably good for me. I don't think I could have, right out of high school, gone and tried to um, get a job, and I wouldn't have had the confidence. Um, so in that sense, it was good. I don't have the same experience as Duke in terms of like a community of people that I went to school with that I know. I, it took me a really long time to get my first job after I graduated. I was. I gave up a bunch of times, you know, and then just kind of sort of, sort of re-tried, um, and eventually I got a job writing on a TV show. But it was a good, um, uh, like, a, like, 11 years after I graduated, and a lot of people that I'd gone to school with had, had fallen away into other, other careers because it was hard. Um, so, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know that it... It, it didn't hurt me, probably. It didn't, maybe it didn't help me in any way that it's clear to me. Um, 
I found my first agent um, because some, some classmate of mine had an agent, and um, he was, um, you know, he got the agent to agree to read a, a spec script that I wrote. But I will tell you this, that um, I got in the door that way, but once he had agreed to read the script, he didn't read it for a year. And, um, and he only read it eventually because I called him every week, which is not like me, but I was desperate. You know, I was desperate, like, because I was like, you know, I was, I was getting to be 30, and you know, and I was like, you know, um, and I was, I'd moved out of New York, and I was like, going to go back to school and study neurophysiology, and there's all this stuff that I was planning on doing, and I didn't, and it was like, what am I going to do? So, um, so his assistant, the agent's assistant, had read it, and so, he was kind of nice to me, and he was always really apologetic. Um, you know, I, I, he hasn't read it yet, he hasn't read it, I'm trying to get him to read it. And this went on, and so I just decided I was going to be, you know, persistent in a way that I never had been before. Because, you know, if I don't get a reaction, I'm, I'm a shy person, and I'll just go, oh, you know, thank you very much, and I'd walk away. So, um, so I called every week, because he always, and the reason I could always call is because he would say, the, 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 he would promise that he would read it. He'd get on the phone and go, Charles, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to read it this week. So then it gave me license to call him back and say, you know, um, have you read it? Um, and he hadn't. And so finally, after a year, I called, and I was just really, you know, just really depressed. And I called the assistant, and I said, look, can you just point me to another agent? Because, um, you know, obviously this isn't going to happen. And the assistant said, okay, okay, just, just wait one minute. And he got on the phone, and he said, okay, I'm going to read it this week. Um, and he didn't, but <laughs> he did read it in like four months later. So, um, and he said, you know, um, oh yeah, uh, great, um, you know, it's great, I'm gonna, and he still wouldn't represent me, but he said, come out to California and I'll get set you up. It's like they call it hip pocket or something where they're, they're not really technically committing to anything, but if they can get you a job, they'll gladly take your 10%. And, um, and, and then I got, I got a job and, and, you know, on a TV show and that was, like a really big deal for me. So, I, that's my story. My story is that, you know, persistence and, and maybe having a little bit more audacity than I actually have paid off. Charlie, todos tenemos la idea, quizá tópica, de guionistas que se han convertido en directores. Todos tendremos eh, quizá un nombre, a mí me viene a la cabeza Billy Wilder, obviamente, que decía que, bueno, que su salto fue natural porque quería controlar el trabajo. Es decir, son malas experiencias vistas desde el punto de vista del guionista lo que han llevado al guionista a convertirse en director. Intuyo que en tu caso no son malas experiencias, pero ¿qué fue realmente lo que te llevó a dirigir, a, a, a pasar <risa> no, a dar ese salto? Y, y, ¿Cuál es la principal diferencia que tú has sentido como, como artista, tanto en un campo como en el otro? I mean, you know, like, like I said earlier, I, I went to film school, um, like Duke, to become a director. So, I mean, um, for me, I went, I went to school with this guy named Chris Columbus, who became very, very famous, very, very young, like while he was still in, in school. And he started as a screenwriter. And so there was sort of like this idea that you could kind of work your way in as a screenwriter. And that didn't work for me until many years later, but I always had it in my mind that, you know, I wanted to, I had a background in theater. I was really interested in theater and I, I made my own films when I was a kid and I was interested in acting and actors. And um, so it wasn't like, oh, I suddenly decided I wanted to direct. It's something I always wanted to do. Um, that being said, yeah, there is a kind of, I did have pretty good experiences, very good experiences, mostly. But there's still a point where, you know, the idea of, of being able to make the ultimate decisions, the final decisions about, about the work and, you know, keeping it as personal, which is a hard thing to do in film on the, under the best circumstances, but it's the ideal thing to do. And, you know, when you're, when you're collaborating, it, it has to sort of, broaden a little bit because you you have two different life experiences that you're that you're contending with um, so I wanted that I wanted the I wanted to you know get to a point where I could direct I, I, meaning that somebody would let me direct and that happened with Synecdoche and 
the difference also that's really important to me is that writing is very um, lonely and it requires a lot of sort of um, discipline because you're just sitting there by yourself in your house. And if it doesn't, um, if you don't do it, it doesn't get done, you know? And, and sometimes it's really um, scary and hard. And then I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a very sort of social person, but I do like occasionally to have other people around. And, um, and I, I, I mean, I like it more than I'm comfortable with it, but I mean, directing forces you into that situation. And also, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like, uh, if, I don't, if I can figure out a scene that I'm writing, I can work on it for two years. If I can't figure out a scene that I'm directing, at the end of the day, we move on. You know, and there's something really great about that. You're just like on a schedule. People tell you where you have to be. They tell you what you have to do. They tell you when you're done with it because you know the day is over. And um, and it's and it's a very condensed thing. And it's exciting. And um, and I like it for that reason as well. Bueno, vamos a abrir el turno a preguntas. Y ahora es vuestro turno. Levantar la mano y os acercaremos un micrófono. Es importante esto del micrófono para que nuestras compañeras traductoras puedan hacer su trabajo. Lo que no veo son manos. Aquí, por ejemplo, tenemos una por aquí. En español, ¿no? Como queráis. Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Lara. I'm hi. I'm up here. Um, I'm from Spain. Studied in Cuba. Lucky enough to be here. And I was wondering because of the. Um, uh, the, I'm, I'm not sure it's the best question to ask first, but because of the fact that you mentioned Dan Harmon was involved in the project, I was wondering, um, first, is that, does that involve like a sort of comedic tone to it, or what was his involvement? And especially because of the fact that um, I'm thinking of the collaborative aspect of it, like, um, is that an extension of film school? you know, how you collaborate with people that you might have not gone to school with, but that somehow become your, your, your mates as well. Yeah, uh, there's two, two sort of parts to that. The, the first part with regards to Dan Harmon, he, he is an owner at the animation studio um, where the film was produced. And he, he and Dino Stamatopoulos are the heads of the studio. And Dan, along with Dino, were actually in the audience at the at the original play. And Dan is just a fan of Charlie's work. And when we decided to pursue it from a studio standpoint, Dan w was lending his name to the project to help build awareness, to raise money, and and that was it. He, he wasn't collaborative um, from a creative standpoint. It was just support from sort of a production executive standpoint to help get the film produced. Um, with regards to the collaboration process, I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, we have two directors on this movie, so that, that was very collaborative. We collaborated on, on everything, on every aspect of, of, of the film, but, and obviously, I mean, you know, filmmaking is very collaborative when you collaborate with everybody and the production designer and the costume designer and the composer and, you know, everything. And I, I think film school, from my perspective, is, is very helpful to establish that idea of collaboration because you know I mean you're sitting at home watching movies growing up and dreaming about being a filmmaker and thinking of your ideas and uh, and wanting to go out and make stuff but learning how to do that with other people and particularly communicate your ideas um, that's something particularly on this last film I, I learned a lot from Char Charlie's very articulate and he's able to kind of like get his idea across very clearly in a way that I was able to understand. Um, I really appreciated that. I think that that's an important aspect of directing, being able to, because you see it in your mind and you have to be able to, other people are going to do this. You know, there's people that are going to have to set the lights up and there's, you know, actors that are going to have to perform something and you have to be able to articulate what it is in your mind that you want them to do. Um, and Certainly, film school is great practice for that, I would say. Would you like to add anything, Charlie? Um, no, no, that was... No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, can I, it's yeah. one thing that's sort of interesting to me. I don't know if this... It sort of applies to what Duke is saying, is that it's interesting, like, um, the, the communicating is so 
vital it to to the production people that you're working with. And there are things that you assume that they're seeing the way you see them, and then you go to a production meeting, and it's, I mean, and these are really, you know, smart people, really talented people, and they're not wrong, they're just different people. And so there's this kind of like unification, I think, that that became part of the process, when, like when I was working on Synecdoche, um, that was like getting everybody to be on the same page, and um, it was interesting to me. And, and yes, this was an enormously collaborative in, in every aspect. Duke and I, obviously, in, in a completely collaborative way with each other. Um, that, and we were, I think, very like-minded, and, and, and so it helped a lot. There wasn't, there wasn't tension between us. Plus, you know, there's just an enormous group of people who are, who are doing things, the animators. I mean, there's not just like, it's different, you know, in a movie where you've got one person playing a part, you've got several people playing the same part because there's all these different animators animating the same character in different scenes. And there has to be kind of an understanding and a consistency between how the characters move and, 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 and everything that, um, that collaboration is really important. That's it. Thanks. Ah, perdón. Eh, buenas tardes a Charlie. Eh, me gustaría primero agradecer eh, la importancia que tu trabajo ha tenido con las decisiones que he tomado eh, en mi vida como, como artista, como director y querer dedicarme precisamente a esto. Me gustaría saber si, porque te veo una persona bastante humilde con tu trabajo, saber si tú dimensionas la importancia que tu trabajo ha tenido en las nuevas generaciones de cineastas y cómo tú estás... No sé si tú eh, ves eh, constantemente películas de, de los nuevos directores y me gustaría saber si tú notas eh, la evolución del lenguaje cinematográfico en las nuevas generaciones. ¿Cómo ves tú eso? <laughs> I only watch films by young people. Um, thank you very much. That's a really nice thing that you said. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's not a good thing to sort of focus on that or try to sort of, for me or maybe for anyone, to try to sort of determine if there's an influence or if it just, it just I think you've got to sort of stay with your work and try to um, be honest. I mean, otherwise, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Um, if there's any sort of like um, notoriety, I, I feel like it's very dangerous to embrace it, you know, for uh, to continue working and trying to do stuff that you feel is the, close to you and real. But I certainly appreciate the the um, compliment, and you know, it's very flattering. Thank you. Hello. Katerina from Vienna, Austria. Um, I want to specifically say thank you for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's one of my top favorite films mm, in the world. <laughs> and I'd like to know a little bit about your writing process and inspiration on that film specifically and how you feel about how the film came out to be. I, I'm, I like the film, you know. I, I It's weird for me to, I don't know Anything that I'm involved with, any film that I'm involved with and I feel like I have a part of um, um, creating in a real way, it's hard for me to have a, 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 an objective opinion about it. I mean, I feel close to all of those things that I've worked on. Um, you know, um, the origin of it is just that um, the director, Michel Gondry, had a friend who had an idea about someone getting erased. Um, and he came to me and I wanted, I think originally he was thinking about um, like making it into a kind of a spy thing or something, you know, kind of like, and I was, I just wanted to make it into something that was about a relationship. And um, it was a struggle writing it for me because I kept wanting to sort of make sure that that was the, there was this conceit that was very interesting to the people who financed it, you know, and is the reason we sold the, the memory erasing thing was the reason You know, it's a new way to tell a love story, is what they said. But I was just more, it was more important to me to make sure that the relationship, 
that it was about this relationship and that this was sort of the dressing of it or, or, or the way to explore it. Um, but that didn't, didn't become central to the, uh, it, it didn't overwhelm trying to have these characters and see what a relationship could, to express a relationship between them. Um, so that's what I remember about writing it. It was very hard for me to write. It took me a very long time, as most things do. Um, and I don't know if I'm answering the question or if there's some sort of specific thing you wanted to know about the process. Yeah, the inspiration of the, the relationship, if, if that came from you or if it was... Oh, it came from me, but it was... A, yeah, I mean, it's about... You know, I mean, and the inspiration came from, I think, to probably, to try to remember back, came from the idea of thinking about love stories and movies and how they always end when the characters get together and that that they're like the relation then so no one really knows at least in the world of cinema what happens when you're in a relationship and how what that struggle is and what it is that you you know when you start um really starting to know somebody and really starting to deal with the 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 projection of of romance onto another person starts to sort of dissolve and you're dealing with just another person. Um, and I thought this was a good way to um, incorporate that into a story because it had the possibility of showing the whole relationship starting from the end and going back to the point where it was about the projection, you know, and the, and the stuff in between. So um, that, that excited me about the, about the way to do that, but that was what I was interested in. I always felt you made it for me, so thank you. I did make it for you. <laughs> I did make it for you. <laughs> Aquí tenemos más. Uh, hi, <laughs> sorry. Hi. Um, so I was want, I wonder, have, I have a question about the writing process as well. Uh, we're trying to write our first feature film, and um, most of the time we feel we should just give up and take our curriculum to the nearest supermarket because it's a, it's a it's a crisis a permanent crisis and i was wondering if you have that sometimes when you're writing and you're saying okay i suck i should give up and do something else with my life and if you have uh, already with your long career if you already have strategies maybe you could share um maybe you say uh, <laughs> i call my mom and try <laughs> to ask her to reassure me or i or i just give up for a couple of months or i uh, you you try to make the pro the writing process more collaborative maybe you you ask a consultant i don't know i'm trying to just throw yeah. ideas <laughs> wait but uh, I, 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 i'm i'm going to answer that but i didn't understand what you were going to do at the supermarket Oh, just drop drop my curriculum. Oh, your so resume. They can okay, hire okay, me okay, yeah, because yeah. Because I, I, because I realize I can't write a feature film. So maybe uh, maybe the supermarket I can. Be every really time, small. every time I've written something, I've gone through exactly what you're going through. Every time. Now I'm doing it. You know, I'm in the process of being frustrated and disappointed and wanting to give up. So. Um, that's reassuring. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, truthfully, one of the things that keeps me going, and this is not necessarily something that's that's applicable to to the first screenplay you're writing, but I mean, if someone pays you, which is you know, like they give you money to to start, I mean, that's almost in every case the reason that I continue, because I I can't pay them back, you know, yeah. so I have to finish it, um, yeah. and. Um, before that was the case, I gave up. I gave up a lot of things. I gave up all the time, and I've got drawers full of stuff that I, that I, I've never finished. Um, I think finishing the first screenplay, it um, is a really it was a really big thing for me, and that was something that I wrote on spec. It wasn't something somebody paid me for, but actually finishing it, getting, mm -hmm. getting done, writing a hundred and some on pages of something which I'd never done before, it didn't really even matter if it was good. It was just done and I did it. I accomplished that and that was important because you, then you know you can write a hundred and something pages of something. Um, when you're, just to sort of like be specific about your case, when you're frustrated and you want to give up, what is it that frustrates you? What is it that you're not seeing in your work that you, that you want to see? I think probably what you mentioned earlier, you, you just said you, you didn't even care if it was good or not. You were just trying to go to, to the end. And maybe um, what happens is that um, we can help judging ourselves during the process. And, and just um, in our case, there's no money involved, so no one is paying us. And um, I think probably that's probably it. Just 
thinking each time you write a page, okay, this does it suck? Um, yeah, but you know, it's okay if it sucks, and it probably does suck at first, and that's common to everybody. I mean, the, I write, I write endless sucky shit, and you know, <laughs> but I, I, I also do what you do. I, I, I judge it. You know, is this bad? Is this bad? I can't go on. But the thing is that, first of all, writing something, and then looking at it when you've got a little bit of distance from it, it's, it's amazing how much clarity you get from that. You know, uh, just like, oh, that sucks, cut it out. Um, and, but, the, but I think if it's possible, and this is very hard, and it's very hard for me, um, if it's possible to write without judgment, to just say, okay, I'm doing this, this sucks, it sucks, but I'm doing it. I'm doing the best I can at this point. I'm trying to get as close as I can at this point. I never have to show it to anybody. I don't have to be embarrassed by it. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to get some clarity when, I, when I'm done, because I'm going to look at it and see how it exists as a whole, which is a very hard thing to do. I don't think you should think about things like, will anyone want to produce this? Um, you know, how will I get it made? Because those are only going to, they're just going to cripple you in the process. Just write it, get through it. Um, don't think about it. Don't read back necessarily. Um, go forward. Um, be true, you know, in the best way you can at the moment, which isn't necessarily going to be the best way you can eventually. But in the moment, that's what you got. So do it. Um, don't worry if it's interesting. Don't worry if it's good. Think it won't be good. Decide that it's not going to be good even. You know, say, yeah. um, okay, this is going to suck, but, but I'm going to do it. And then it'll be done. And... And, and do you set yourself a, yourself a schedule? Because I was thinking about the, the, the Sylvester Stallone technique, just shutting the blinds and not eating. Or not. <laughs> because Sylvester Stallone, yeah. apparently for Rocky, he just shut the blinds and just like, didn't eat or didn't go out until he finished. And I was wondering if you set yourself a, a time schedule. You, you said to yourself, OK, I'm going to write four hours a day, even if it's crap. I'm just going to. Yeah, I always do that, and I never do. I never succeed. I okay. mean, it's a, I always decide that because I read that I'm supposed to do that. And, you know, yeah. the, in, the internet, working on a computer, the internet, internet is my biggest enemy because yeah. when I'm stuck, I just go online, you know, yeah. look at shit, and suddenly five hours have passed and I've wasted a day. But, I mean, I, you know, like the last screenplay I wrote, uh, I was kind of on a really tight schedule because I had another thing I had to finish and I was taking it because I needed, needed to get paid um, for something so I could finish this other thing. And um, I was going to write it in... Um, 12, 12 weeks, and I wrote it in eight months, um, which is actually short for me, but much longer than 12 weeks. And um, I just couldn't do it, you know, and I couldn't do it, so I didn't do it. And it pushed everything back, and it really screwed up my schedule, and, you know, um, but that's all I, you know, that's what happened. And, um, it, you know, it's interesting also, um, it, things that I've found when I've worked on something, and I've worked on things for maybe over two years, screenplays, single screenplays. And I found sometimes things that I come to a year and a half in, I'm so glad I didn't rush it, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, oh, I would have finished it and it would have been not, not this thing that I suddenly stumbled upon. Sometimes I'm really slow. Like sometimes I'll come to an idea that I think is obvious, but it's obvious not immediately. It's obvious to me maybe through the process of um, just working and reworking, it becomes obvious to me. And suddenly one day it's like, oh, there's that, and I've solved it. To, you know, in a way, at least I feel like I've solved it for myself. So um, no, I think you should know that it, it's a kind of a collaboration with yourself, that you have ideas, and those ideas are going to eventually maybe lead to other ideas that you're going to have that are going to be different, um, and that you're not going to get right away the first thing is not going to be necessarily going to be the greatest thing that you um, come up with and give yourself um, the freedom to fail, you know, and realize that if you're not failing, then you really have no chance of doing anything interesting because you're, you, you've got to push yourself and try things that you don't know how to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. More questions? Other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I don't want to repeat what the others said, but big fan, whatever, thank you for being here. Um, when I was in film school, I had this, this thing that was really frustrating when we talked about the script writing. It's like uh, someone somewhere sometime drew a line between what was like a normal script and a not normal script. 
I didn't really understand what was the difference, but I think that I wanted to do things that were not like really normal. Um, and they were really frustrating me because they were always saying like, okay, you have to go through the phase of writing like narrative, normal things, and then you will get to the point where you can do like weird stuff or whatever. And then I remember thinking about, about your script writing and, and like being John Malkovich and so on. And I, I said like, okay, that, that's the kind of shit I like, you know, that's like, I love it. And why do I have to go to a phase where I write things that I don't like? just to get to the point of writing the, the, the things that I do like. So do you think that's like a, um, do you think that, that that's like a good idea? Like you, you have to learn to, to write really narrative things and then and then you can like learn to to I don't know how to explain it, like to go to um, strange things to put it in a way. Do you think that's like really the way to go? Or maybe you have only to trust what you want to do and and fuck normal? <laughs> well I mean when you say narrative you mean conventional, conventional narrative, right? Yeah, like, yeah, like, like three conventional, act, uh, yeah, conventional three act, yeah. you know, like normal things, not going inside the mind of, uh, mind of the people, not like erasing memories, not like uh, going inside John Malkovich's head. <laughs> you know, this kind of thing that I really like and my teachers in script writing were always saying like, yeah, yeah, okay, you wait for this. I mean, you wait for this kind of things. And first you go normal, like boy meets girl and whatever. And I was like really like bored and frustrated for that reason. Well, I mean, I, I kind of feel that you should gravitate towards the things that excite you. You know, I mean, wh how, why should you torture yourself trying to write something that doesn't interest you? I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's not like you don't understand dramatic structure inherently. I mean, we all do because we grow up watching TV and movies. So even, even just on an instinctive level, you know certain things that you have to replicate it in, in some sort of screenplay. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see the point of that. I think the thing is like, you, you know, for me, it's like I come up with an idea and I get excited. Oh, that's an idea. You know, like for me, it's always like, oh, I, I would love to see that in a movie. I would love to see that in a movie. So I'll write that because, because I get to, <laughs> you know, I get to write it. So um, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't know if you have an assignment for a class and you have to do something conventional, then I guess you have to do it. But for your own, you know, joy and your own uh, passion, you should do the things that you're passionate about. I think. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, granted, doing that makes it harder to get them made. But so you have to consider that and consider, weigh that against, you know, doing, you know, if you want to get a big Hollywood deal, then maybe that is not the thing you want to put out there right away. But but it doesn't sound like that's what you're about. That's what you see. So you want to do the things you want to do. So do the things you want to do. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Tenemos por allá arriba algunas cuantas. Vamos por arriba. Um, can we have a, a little take on, like, snapshot on the things that excite you at the moment? Um, you mean other, other? Yes, other, other than Anomalisa, maybe like, the, like the thing that you are excited by now, the subjects, the themes. Um, Is it too personal a question? I mean, yeah, I'm working on stuff now that isn't um, ready to be talked about. Um, okay. So I'd rather kind of not. But um, suffice to say that it involves puppets. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> no, it does. It actually does a little bit, but <laughs> but not only. Um, you know, I just like, you know, it's just like li my life and things that... Um, seem true to me and, and that I'm frustrated with or sad about or um, it's always sort of like that kind of stuff. We have another one there. Ahora vamos aquí. Vamos allá arriba primero. Ah, estáis aquí. Hello, this is a question for both of you. Um, Animation is a process that takes a very long time, and especially when your source material is something that's visually really abstract. Um, here, Charlie. Oh, thank you. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, when you're dealing with source material, material that's really abstract, um, and you're trying to animate that through a long period of time, I can imagine that um, you will rediscover the material um, and maybe make different decisions. And I was wondering what your process was like for, for both of you since you were collaborating. If you found elements of the story while you were animating it um, that you hadn't thought about and what was the process. And my second question, sorry, I'm, I'm, 
My second question is, how do you deal with fear? What's your relationship like with fear? That's it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, well, with this specific project, um, how to visualize it, because it was, I, I wish you guys would have seen the movie, but it's, it's, it was specifically a play originally with no descriptions of any visuals. It's b people sitting on stage just kind of like talking about things, and it was meant for the audience to see it in their minds and decide what the visuals were. And that was like the whole point of the thing. And then so now, okay, we're going to make a film, which is a visual medium, and we have to make decisions on what all these things look like. Specific things that were written to not be described. We have to describe them. Um, and that was uh, an interesting challenge. And it, it was just a lot of conversation and a lot of, a lot of talking. I mean, we kept going back to wanting it, wanting it to be feel soulful and authentic um you know it's it's uh there's a love story in the film and um and the, the it, there's an interaction that characters have with each other in that environment and we just wanted to explore explore that and, and make it feel um very real and very natural and everything kind of grew out of that idea and it did change the material did change um even though the script is the same as it was, just by way of it becoming this new thing, a, an animated visual thing, um, it changed and became tonally different than the original. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, and Charlie will definitely add to it. I'll, I'll just I'll just say my bit, or maybe not. <laughs> I'll just say my bit about fear. Um, Oh man, this this movie for me, it, it, the three years of this process, and uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, uh, I I was compelled to want to do it because I, I like many of you. I, I'm a huge fan of Charlie's work, and and this was a great opportunity for me um, to work with material that I believed in so much, and so I believed in the project. And that was very compelling to me. But it was so hard. People quitting and losing animators and running out of money and um, running out of time and, and it's not going to get made and, and, and everything is falling apart and you build the puppets and they don't work. And, you know, it was just horrible. Um, and I, I think the thing that's great about production, which is different than, like, writing a screenplay... Um, in my experience is that, you know, there's a, there's a crew that shows up every day and, you know, these people, it's their job to do this and this is how they make their living and they show up at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning and they leave at 8 PM or whatever. And, and it's happening every day and the, the, the train is headed down the tracks and you're responsible for it and you're responsible for all these people and all this money and, uh, and for the integrity of the project itself and whether or not it's going to be good and and you just have to show up every day and you just you're scared but you just show up every day and uh and it's and yeah that's it i don't know that's how i do it that's how i deal with fear i just show up every day <laughs> I mean, it, in terms of um, how it changed in the process, I think that uh, um, because, as Duke said, it was a, a completely different form at first. Um, I was reticent to do it in this in this form um, because it was going to be giving up um, certain things. Like, for, for example, uh, um, there's something physically wrong with the main with the main character. Um, it's referred to, it's alluded to, but we never know what it is in, in the play. So the idea is that you've got an audience full of people and everybody has a different idea in their head about what the story is, you know, what's wrong with her. It's never mentioned, um, it's, it's ambiguous, it's never in the script that, even for the movie, it's never mentioned, but we had to decide what it is and now everybody knows it's the same thing and that was something I, because I was so attached to that other idea that was hard for me. Um, to let go of it and think that it would be 
uh, worthwhile to do it this way. But once we decided, once I agreed to it and we decided to do it, um, I think what so much of so much of what you do in animation is front loaded because you have to make all these decisions ahead of time, you know. And we didn't have money to reshoot things, so we had to, you know, be very do this animatic and be very close to it, you know, in, in production. But I think we started to understand what the stop motion animation world brought that was new to this as we were working. What what was new to this um, idea thematically and, and just even just physically. And I think that we started to incorporate that as we went along, I would say. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. Um, as 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 far as fear, um, I I mean you're talking about fear professionally or um, I'm talking about fear something that unites everyone. Everyone has fear and everyone yeah. has to deal with it and has a relationship with it. Right. I'm wondering if you give me an insight of your relationship with fear and how you treat it or work with it or challenge it. Or I mean, I think that um, I might deal with it in a professional way different than I do in a personal way. I think that m my professional life is m more of a place where I feel forced or compelled to put myself in danger you know, um, emotional danger and stuff. And I'm, I'm more, I think I'm more timid in my, much more timid in my, in my actual existence. Um, I think about that a lot. I mean, I don't, I, I wish that, I wish that I somehow wasn't, but I'm, I'm getting to a point now in my life where it seems like it's kind of just the way it is, you know. Um, um, but in terms of work, uh, I, I feel like, you know, um, you know, I've said this thing about failure being a badge of honor, um, and I feel like it is. I feel like I, I try to look at it that way, you know, in terms of fear of failure. I feel like if you fail, it only means that you tried to do something that was dangerous, that you didn't know how to do. And it's seen as a very negative thing to fail, but I don't see it that way. Or at least I try to not see it that way, like, okay, I'm gonna take a chance. And in order to take a chance, I have to accept the fact that it may not be successful in any on any terms, not commercially or critically, or even on my own terms, even personally. So um, I think for me that's a that's a helpful way to deal with the idea of being afraid. Um, but I don't know if you're talking about other kinds of fear. If you no, no that, that's that's mostly what I was talking about. Okay, I think that for me it is the place where I can be most honest or brave about, you know, who I am. Um, and I think honesty is the, like in terms of, the, well, you got a whole bunch of questions there, but like in terms of like alternative <laughs> narrative, I think it's, I think it's really important. That's the most important aspect of it. That for me, when I'm doing it, it has to be grounded in some reason that I'm doing it, that there's some exp something I'm trying to express that is, and this is the best way I know how to express it. I give myself the freedom to be, um, you know, free with it, um, but that it's not like, okay, what's the weirdest idea I can think of and then just slap it into a movie, and I think that, for me, that is not interesting to do or to watch. I, I, I read this um, thing that I think Philip Roth said, I'm not sure, because it was a long time ago, but um, he, he, it, was a, it was a line, basically, that every, everything I do has to be more naked than the last thing. I did, and I think that I think that that's kind of a cool way to think about stuff. It's like, how do I be more honest? How do I get closer to saying something that's real about me and the way I am in the world, or the way I see the world, or my experience in the world, and without trying to sort of be clever, you know? I mean, I like being clever, and I'm pleased when people think I am, but it can't be the reason. It can't be. The, it, it can. It, it can only be in my mind, only in service of that this is the best way that I can think of to um, explore this idea or express this idea or um, reveal this about myself. Um, if it's first and foremost, then it becomes something else that I feel is um, not, to me, not valuable to, to, to participate in. Here we have one. Y luego vamos por aquí. Primero ahí. 
Hi. Aqui. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, uh, hi guys, thanks for being here. Charlie, I was wanting to ask you um, about uh, adaptation and if you can tell us a little bit about the writing process and adaptation and also if you can tell us a little bit how you work with dialogues. Um, first, I want to just sort of reiterate, I'm really sorry you guys haven't seen the movie because it's a really good movie and Duke deserves a lot of questions. No, I need to. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what about adaptation? How was the writing process? Like uh, it was hard. Yeah, I mean, what, what, uh, the process of adaptation is fairly close to what the movie shows. I mean, I I took this job on because I didn't know how to do it, and I thought it was really interesting to do a movie about. I liked the book a lot, and but the book really has very little story. It's mostly about orchids, and I I wanted to sort of try to do a movie that was the cinematic version of that and I just I just struggled for a really long time and um, when I started to think oh what if I do this about the what if, I started to think and I've, and I've done this since then too in, in other projects is like what is it that I'm thinking about now what is it I'm in, emotionally in the middle of now because it was really depressing you know what am I in the middle of and that I can imbue the script with that and so I started to think what I'm in the middle of is that I don't know how to write this thing and so I, I started to think about making it about the writing of the thing and suddenly I could write it you know suddenly there was like this sort of like all of these connections were being made in my mind between what the book was about and you know um, um, uh, what I was, the, the, the inability to, to, to do it. And, um, you know, the idea that the book is about the natural adaptation of, um, of the, this plant species and, and that I was writing about the adaptation of this book didn't immediately even occur to me. Like, it just, like, stuff like that just fell into place. I just thought, okay, I'll, this is a way in, I'll write about me. And, um, you know, I gave myself a brother initially because writing is sitting alone in a room, and I, I wanted to have the character have someone to talk to. So it struck me as funny that he'd have this brother, and then his brother became kind of this ne'er-do-well who wanted to be a screenwriter, and then it, it was allowed, you know, allowed me to have these conversations between them. And it just really, after like a year and a half of just sitting there, suddenly I could write this thing really, um, not quickly, but, but um, um, there was, there was momentum, you know? So I don't know if that's answering you, what you were asking specifically, yeah. but that's the... And, and how did you deal with the fact that in a moment, I guess, you said, uh, I'm going to be in the movie as a character and stuff like that? I mean, because it's very different. I, th I think it's very original. And how the, s the studio reacted about it? I was terrified. And it was, um, you know, I, I was terrified when I did it. And I, and I, I liked that. Like I was saying before, like that is something that excites me because like it's such a disaster waiting to happen, you know? And I mean, I just, at that point, I had just done one movie. I wasn't well known. It's like, what, who the fuck is this guy? You know, he's like, and, um, and I didn't tell the studio that I was doing it because I was sure they were going to say, no, you're not doing that. You know, we're not, we're not buying that. And I didn't have any other ideas. And I thought, this is the only thing I can write. And when I turned it in, um, it to, to was Jonathan Demi's company was producing it. Um, this guy, Ed Saxon, who was a producer on the movie, I didn't even tell them. And, I, and the script was written by Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman. That's what I handed in. And his initial reaction was, what the fuck? You know, we didn't hire him to collaborate with some, somebody else, you know. And so they were mad. And, um, and then there was the big sort of like, well, what is all these real people are in it, you know, what is Susan Orlean who wrote the book, you know, we're going to have to get life rights from her, and it's, you know, it, it's saying that she's a drug addict, and she slept with this person she was interviewing, and it's very, you know, unethical journalistically to do that, and how is she going to react to it, and, um, but then, you know, it just sort of, luckily, for, obviously for me, it, it kind of, um, everybody was okay with it eventually, you know, it took a few days of people getting used to the idea. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great movie. And, and sorry, one other question. D d can you tell us a little bit about uh, your process with dialogues? I mean, if you have a kind of special process or... With di dialogue or dialects? Dialogue. You mean just writing characters? No, no, no what, what they speak, I mean. 
I mean, you think first about the, the scenes, the images, or, or what the people Conversations, do. you yeah, mean. Conversations, yeah, okay, just don't so understand. Um, it's really hard for me to write dialogue early on, I find. I've tried to like just jump in and write a scene when I'm in the early process of, of trying to figure out a script, and I, I can't do it. And it's usually just a waste of time, and it's usually something I never use. I find that I, I start to do a lot of um, notes you know, I don't really outline things, but I write a lot of thoughts and a lot of notes, and I start to feel like I understand the characters, maybe, and then I try again, and then eventually, it, you know, other writers say this, and I think there's some truth for it, in it for me, is that it starts to sort of feel like coming out of them a little bit. I mean, I know it's not. I know I'm writing it, but I think it's because I have some understanding of them that I didn't have at first that allows me to... And once I start to do that, this, the movie changes, you know? It's not like I outline a scene, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, and then the scene ends. It's like I start writing dialogue in a scene, and I get an idea for a plot change, you know, or for a scene to go in a different direction because the characters start talking about something else. It always happens. It always happens for me, and I'm always so thrilled with that, you know? And I, I like to, that's why I don't wanna outline stuff, is because I like to leave myself open to the possibility that that, that could happen. And then the movie changes, and, um, um, and, that's, and, and that seems to happen in that stage when I'm doing dialogue. I can't, it's, it's very hard for me to think um, in a large way until I'm at that stage about where the story is going to go. Great, thank you. I have a very practical question because I had the pleasure of seeing Anomalisa. <laughs> and now, of course, I want to see the play. And is it available anywhere? And then a question to Duke. Um, how was it to... How was it to work with, like, your ideal? Like, how was it to work with somebody you admire so much? Do you want to answer first, or...? I can I, say how, how oh. see the play. Oh, yeah, that's true. No. You can't, actually. I mean, the play was um, never recorded. We weren't allowed to record it because the actors were working. Um, it was the, the Actors' Equity, which is the um, actors' um, um, union in, in the United States, was, would not allow us to record it because of the contract we had with the actors. We had talked about redoing it, um, you know, because it's all the same actors, and they, we really enjoyed it. Um, but as of now, it's not, av it's not available. Um, well, please do redo it. <laughs> um, I was super excited to work with Charlie. I was also very intimidated. Um, I was thinking, well, if we're going to collaborate and then he's going to come in and he's Charlie Kaufman and who am I and uh, he's not going to listen to my ideas. And, you know, I had all this stuff going on in my head, but uh, I was amazed at, uh, from the start of working with Charlie. He was very... Um, he was very open to to my ideas and my perspective and um and I loved his ideas and and it, we just we just got on well we saw it pretty much the same the same way um you know I loved the script and he wrote the script and so obviously you know he's got great ideas and 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 uh and um I don't know what else to say about it. It was, it was, it was a great experience. Um, you said you didn't disagree, but are you really like? Was there nothing? No, I mean we had disagreements. Absolutely. I mean certainly. What was I, I, like a major one? Like, tell us a little bit about how you work together. Well, you know, I mean, what happens is, is like sometimes there's no. Uh, like uh, you, you're thinking of like a color. What color should the wall be? You know, what what, what does. Uh, what does a certain mood feel like in, in color? Well, to me, it's orange. To Charlie, it's green or something. I just made that up. That's not true. But, um, you know, I, I, you just, we're just different people with different experiences, so you can see things differently. And so sometimes, you, you know, you have to make a choice. And uh, um, you, you come to terms with something like that. Um, so... I'm trying to think of if there was like a, a challenging, I don't, you know, um, just a lot of back and forth and trying. Th the the good thing is is that you can you can try stuff. You know, it's sort of like uh, maybe I would pitch an idea to Charlie and and he would say, okay, well I can't I can't really see it. 
you know, but let's try it, you know, and you shoot like a test or you um, try it out in storyboards or something. And then you look at it and you say, okay, well, it doesn't really work like that, but we've learned this from that and now we can change it. And it, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of back and forth, trying things, experimenting, changing things. So it wasn't, we didn't have to, it, stop motion moves much slower than live action. So it's not like we had to make like a in the moment decision, is it your way or is it my way? We were able to kind of like experiment and try things out and it, it became sort of like uh, both of our ways met and it became a new way that we both kind of loved and discovered. Um, I don't know, something to add to that? No, no, just that I think that, you know, he said that, uh, um, you, you know, he, I listen to his ideas and the reason I listen to his ideas is because they're good and because he's, he's really good to work with. And um, we do, um, you know, I do, I do think there's a certain kind of taste that we share. Um, and that was obviously very helpful. Um, and, you know, there weren't, there weren't big fights, really. There were little disagreements and a couple of things that we disagreed about that I don't think either of us was, was really sure of, which, you know, we were right. And so we kind of lived with things for a while and made decisions, and I think I uh, feel comfortable that we ended up making the right decisions. Sometimes it's like stuff like, you know, because there's no actors. You know, once the actors are recording, they're just puppets. And so you have to decide things that you wouldn't normally have to decide, like how is this person going to cross the room? How is this person going to, you know, what's the dynamic between these two characters at this moment? What is it going to look like, you know? And you have to make really, really concrete decisions there about stuff like that. And, you know, we're different people, um, as he said. And But it was, I think it was very, very, I think it was at least, I think it was harmonious. So, yeah. It was good. I, I, would, I think we would work together again um, very comfortably. And do you think you would work together on a live action too? Like as well as you did in, in animation? I don't, think, I don't think so. I think that, I, I, I don't, not, not, because of, not because of Duke, just because I don't know how that works, you know, um, how that works with a live action film. It's like Duke was saying, this is a very different process. And certainly, you know, coming into this, Duke had an enormous amount of experience in, in this, in this type of work and I had none and so that was a very important you know component of our collaboration uh, it isn't the only component you know and it, I, I want to be very clear about that but that's the reason that it happened initially I mean I do think that you know um, Duke, is, Duke is is he happens to have experience in animation but he's not an animator he's a filmmaker and he's got experience making live action films and he wants to continue doing that and um, And he will. No, just with regards to us collaborating on live action, like my next film I, I want to do is live action. And and I spend a lot of time talking to Charlie about it. And, uh, you know, I would, I, I respect his opinion so much that I would want to involve him in the, in the process as much as he'd like to be involved to get his advice and, uh, and his opinion on things. Because I, like he said, I think we, we have similar taste in that regard. You heard that the same time I heard it. So that's a, thank you. <laughs> I was curious about something about the, regarding anomalies. You mentioned before that may, maybe the most difficult thing was to to try to make concrete and try to um, make, make explicit something that was completely the opposite uh, when it was a theater play. And it was just wondering because I loved very much the music in the movie and you mentioned that the music was part of the of the play very important part of the play I was wondering if uh, the music had just the opposite process like it was more explicit in a in a non visual play than what it is in the movie Can I answer that one? It's a good question uh, I, yeah the, I mean, it is actually we it's funny because listening to the music from the play we loved it and this music is great and we're like this is gonna still love it. yeah no we still it it it's amazing and it's beautiful incredible music and for written for the play but it's a different medium so we started with kind of just applying the music to the movie and we realized okay well this is a movie it's a different thing and it needs a different kind of uh approach to the music um and so the music is is uh, some of it's the same 
and it's very similar, but it's a little different. And in, in places, it's more subtle. Um, absent. Yeah, it's absent in places. We took it out in places. Um, it, it was a lot of yeah, sort of taking things away. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the you know, um, in in the in, in the play, just for example, we there's a scene where the character is running down a hallway frantically. And it's in the movie as well, but you see it. You don't need the, you know, the orchestration is designed because there's nothing to see and it's creating a tension that is already inherent in the visual. And so, it, you know, we, 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 we actually brought it down a bit. We, did we, we didn't really remove it. We removed most of it. There's an- It's in layers. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Got rid of layers. Yes. Okay, uh, we have like five minutes. So last questions. Here we have one, and then, okay. Um, could you elaborate a bit about the, the visual style of the film? You, you described it as, as um, dreamlike, but it's also almost um, photorealistic, and, and at times you, you forget that, you, that you're watching uh, puppets, and, and also how you developed um, uh, those puppets and the, and, the, and the look of them. Um, well, we wanted it to not, you know, a lot of animated stuff is very sort of broad and very cartoony um, and very exaggerated. And, and we didn't want it to feel that way right off the bat. We First thing we did before designing anything is we recorded the actors working together. And they delivered a very moving, soulful performance um, that was very inspiring to us and we we wanted to stay true to that so we went in there thinking we have to design something that's very that's very honest and real and soulful and um with that approach in mind ultimately we ended up getting real people and uh sculpting maquettes based off these real people and uh and then also along the way, as we're sort of designing these sort of photorealistic puppets, you know, they have, you can see their puppets, so they have uh, their their mechanics, how, how they function is visible um, in them as well. And again, with stop motion, typically what they do in stop motion films is they use computers to paint that stuff out so that it's like seamless. And we, we didn't want to do that because we liked the fact that you could see that this was handmade and that it was something that was uh, uh, fabricated and, and created and, and it had that, that added to the soulfulness of it to us um, because it was like you know being able to see the, the brush strokes in the painting. Um, you, could, you could feel the human presence um, in their in their fabrication and ultimately that ended up making sense to us thematically with the story as well um and so it 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 um we we just embraced that and that's that's how that's how it evolved so a last question sorry Hola, es en español. Bueno, es interesante que, que nos habéis invitado a imaginar una película en la que a la vez se imagina otro mundo, es un poco curioso. Nada, simplemente quería comentar, eh, y también para todos los compañeros, eh, una, co una cuestión que yo siempre he pensado ¿no? con alguna de tus películas y es eh, los títulos. ¿no? Para mí es una de las partes más importantes, que parece una tontería, pero... Eh, parece que hay que resumir en una palabra toda la clave, el universo, la, la, la sensación de una película. ¿no? Y, y, y bueno, quizá eh, aquí hay mucho problema con eso. ¿no? El ejemplo igual más emblemático es el de, de Rosemary's Baby, que es, eh, aquí en España se tradujo como la semilla del diablo, lo que atenta directamente con el papel como espectador que tú vas a tener durante el proceso de de experiencia ¿no? de la película y ocurre con, con tus películas y no sé si estás al corriente de ello. Eh, entonces, podemos reír juntos, podemos llorar juntos, pero debes saber 
que eh, Eternal Sunshine aquí se llama Olvídate de mí. Siento haberte dado esta noticia. <risa> eh, adaptation, el eh, ladrón de orquídeas. Y, y bueno, eh, ¿cómo te sientes? <risa> I'll say before I hand it over to Charlie, he could talk about how he feels about the titles. Uh, even the subtitles um, is very interesting. I, I noticed watching our movie subtitled in Spanish here, there's some specific things that Charlie does he, with language and with words and with word repetition. I noticed there's one thing uh, towards the end of the film where Uh, one of the characters says, uh, for fuck's sake, and then, uh, sorry about it. for fuck's sake, she says the same thing twice, but in the Spanish subtitles, it was two different things, um, which, you know, I was talking to somebody, like, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, it kind of, like, brought it up a notch, which I guess that works, and, you know, maybe it has a similar feel, but it's not the same, it's not the exact same thing, because what he did is he, she says something, she apologized for it, and then she says the exact same thing. It's It's different. Um, I worry about that. I, I don't know what to do about that because I don't speak every language, so I can't oversee the subtitles. Uh, yeah, I'm American, so I speak one language. Um, yeah, almost one language. Uh, badly. Um, so, yeah, I, it worries me. Um, I don't know what to do about it. I'm open to advice. Yeah, there's. I, I think what he said, I've noticed a lot. There were some, um, um, there are puns and things like that. There are the repetitions that they, I feel like they're correcting me, like they're going, oh, he didn't, he didn't mean to say that twice the same way, so let's, let's fix it for him. No one asks. But I remember I did have some conversations about Synecdoche, New York, where there's a line in there um, where the main characters are in bed, the, he, he and his wife are in bed, and she's kind of half asleep, and um, he's just been examining his feces in the toilet. And um, in in e English, um, another word for it is stool. And so he says, I think there's blood in my stool. Uh, he says that in bed to her, you know, and, and she's kind of half asleep, and she says, the stool in your office? Now, a stool is a seat, um, and it's... Uh, that's and the guy wanted to try make it another pun in French so that it would kind of still play as a pun, but it was like so far away you had to like walk a mile to get the joke, you know. And so, so we got these like lines and stuff like that that just um, that just don't play. Um, yeah, I think, and also like we had this thing about the title for Eternal Sunshine in Italy, which I don't know if there's any Italian people here because they can correct me. Um, There was a line, I mean, the, they, they wanted to change it to something like, I love you, now I'm going to erase you. Was that the title? Beca because there had been a series of movies or a movie before that had been very popular that had, I love you, now I'm going to something else. Um, right. And it was like, well, no. I mean, first of all, there's, you know, it's a beautiful line from a beautiful poem, and it's ambiguous, and it, and it doesn't say anything, and it's graceful, and... and um, But we had no. We said no. No one will go to see the movie with that title. So you know, there's not. It's not. We have no control over it. It's. It's not a battle we can ever win. And some of them obviously are funny, um, but you know, it's not so funny when you're, when you're trying to protect your baby. Um, but I, w what your question is, how do I feel about it? Or um, yeah, I. I prefer that we keep the titles that that we have. Um, but you know, say la vie. Well, we have to leave it here. It's been a great pleasure for us to have you. Oh, thank, you. Been thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.